Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be told for our Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit Return of the Mummy. Along with Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, this was one I actually owned. However, that didn't stop me from forgetting most of this book when I looked at it this week. I get why I didn't really remember it, because the plot lines of these two books are incredibly similar. It's like this was a draft version of the first one. I gained nothing reading this book that I didn't already get from the first one. If you've read the first one, you probably don't need to read this one. I think the cover is even a lesser version of the original. Curse of the Mummy's Tomb gave us a solid look at the mummy, so this one had to settle for a shot of the sarcophagus, I guess. It doesn't look bad by any means, and I like the green stale air creeping out with the mummy. It's just a lesser version to me, and it kind of lines up with how I view the books. The 2006 slime border has a whole lot of gold going on, and despite this, I don't think it looks terrible. They flipped the image and darkened it a bit as well. I think the blue and gold go together really nicely, and in some ways it works better than the original, which is almost too blue. The 2010 version is very similar to the original. Usually these later 2000s ones really try to switch it up, but this is essentially just the same thing as the 1994 one. It's all a bit glossier, and the mummy's hand looks more threatening, but really they just took every element from the original cover and turned it up. I think it's fine. Return of the Mummy had a lot of merchandise, because mummies are easy to market apparently. We have the usual trading cards, an awesome lithiograph, a scary stamper, a terror topper pencil topper, which is kind of like a tongue twister, another version of a gruesome pen, a mummy notebook, a mummy whiteboard, a mummy textbook cover, and a mummy pencil box that, although not efficient in any way, is very cool. We also have another one of these weird credit card things. This one says, the cold cash card saves you money since the mummy's curse makes it invalid for credit anywhere. You have to pay cold cash for everything instead of building up pyramid-sized debts and interest. And cold cash comes with a mummy back guarantee. We also have another Halloween card. This one says, the mummy has his eye on you this Halloween. When you're done with it, please give it back to him. Happy Halloween. Our front tag says, he's back from the dead. And I don't think this is the most exciting tag a person could come up with for a mummy sequel, but it's fine. Our back tag says, dead or alive. I think the endless possibilities of mummy puns makes both of these tags kind of lame. This book is just kind of low effort in general, it seems. So before we start the summary, let's read the blurb on the back. After last year's scary adventure, Gabe's a little nervous about being in Egypt, back near the ancient pyramids, back where he saw those creepy mummies. Then he learns about an Egyptian superstition, a secret chant that's supposed to bring mummies to life. Gabe's uncle says it's just a hoax, but now it sounds like somebody's moving in the mummy's tomb. No way a couple of dumb words can wake the dead, can they? Okay, now let's do our summary. The book opens with our reintroduction to Gabe, who, if you remember from The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, was our protagonist with an inferiority complex. The boy couldn't handle that his cousin Sari was just better than him. Gabe is currently mid-flight on his way to Cairo, where his Uncle Ben will be picking him up for another adventure. Gabe is hesitant since his last adventure involved an evil sorcerer raising the dead and nearly being boiled to death in a tar pit. Gabe mentions to the flight attendant that he visited his uncle last summer, which isn't true, he visited him last Christmas, but who needs continuity in a sequel? He also gives us a brief summary about what this book will entail. Uncle Ben has been working on an unexplored pyramid and will be opening a never-before-seen sacred tomb while Gabe is there. I'm sure only good things will come from this. Gabe also reminds us that he has his lucky, mummified magic child hand that he got from a yard sale for $2, which can also control the dead and is known as a summoner. I'm glad Stein has given us a refresher because I had forgotten how ridiculous this little mummy hand was. It looked like a mummy hand. The fingers were wrapped in stained gauze bandages with a little black tar showing through. The strange thing about the mummy hand is that it's always warm. It doesn't feel like plastic. It feels warm, like a real human hand. This warm part, in addition to being gross, is apparently very important because in a chapter cliffhanger, Gabe touches the hand in his pocket and discovers the hand was cold. Cold as ice. That's pretty cold. Then Gabe gives us a look back into life before cell phones because once the plane has landed, he realizes he can't find his Uncle Ben and has no way of knowing if Uncle Ben remembered he was coming that day or not. To make matters worse, he doesn't have a phone number for Uncle Ben, so he's currently just standing in a crowded Egyptian airport like, hopefully he remembers me. A man suddenly appears in a burnous with a hood large enough to cover his entire face. The man asks Gabe if he needs a taxi, but Gabe thinks it's just Uncle Ben dressing up as a joke to confuse him. This isn't an unreasonable assumption to make considering Uncle Ben dressed up as a mummy and broke into Gabe's hotel in the last book. Gabe hugs the man and pulls off his hood, only to discover that this man isn't his uncle and is just some random guy in a chapter ending. This mystery is short-lived though because in the next sentence we have actual Uncle Ben shouting, Gabe! Gabe! Over here! I wanted more time with Gabe and the Hooded Man to really flesh out this awkward situation, but we have to move on to some Sari hating. In the next couple of pages, we re-establish Gabe's simmering jealousy of Sari because we learn that she gets all A's, is a champion skier and tennis player, has already explored the new pyramid, and is able to carry Gabe's suitcase with ease 
making her also much stronger than him. All of this leaves Gabe seething. They take a jeep, not a station wagon, out to the newest pyramid. This one is way outside Cairo, so they won't be able to stay in a hotel this time. Instead, they'll be roughing it in some desert tents. Sari warns Gabe about mosquitoes and scorpions, which he interprets as a slight because he thinks that she's just trying to scare him. Gabe has great timing because in the next few days they plan on opening a new ancient tomb for the first time and I'm assuming this is where we'll get to see the mummy action. But I spoke too soon because Uncle Ben is checking his pockets for Gabe's present. A shadow looms over them and Gabe starts shrieking because the shadow belongs to a mummy in a chapter cliffhanger. Uncle Ben then starts laughing because the mummy ends up just being some guy named John in a costume. They were shooting a commercial for band-aids out at the pyramids and Uncle Ben called in a favor. This is honestly a dick move on Uncle Ben's part because these children were literally just attacked by mummies a few months ago, so they have to have some sort of PTSD from that. Uncle Ben makes up for this though by giving Gabe an awesome gift, a pendant with a 4,000 year old amber stone that contains a fully preserved scarab beetle. This is some Jurassic Park shit and I want it. Sari is jealous and while walking towards the tent she shouts, the scarab, it escaped, it's down there, while pointing at Gabe's leg and suddenly he feels a bite in a chapter ending. But of course, it's just sorry pinching him. I truly thought that the 4,000 year old beetle came to life, so this was quite the surprise. That night, as Gabe is struggling to fall asleep, he thinks he feels the scarab move in the pendant, dismisses it, and then goes to sleep. The next morning, Gabe wakes up and laments that there's no frosted flakes and that he has to go with a raisin bran. I know that I'm getting old because I love raisin bran. It's also funny to me that this book can't keep track of the timeline from the last book, but it does remember a throwaway reference to frosted flakes from the first book, where Gabe wanted to save the box that had Arabic writing on it. We learn that this tomb that they're trying to open was the cousin of King Tut, Prince Koru. Uncle Ben has high hopes that this tomb will be full of jewels and treasure, but Sari is concerned her dad is getting his hopes up and will be crushed if it ends up just being an empty room. They head on over to the pyramid and just as they're heading in, a woman named Nyla runs over and is like, stop, don't go in. Gabe can't get over how hot he thinks this woman is, and Uncle Ben seems to be of the same mindset. It turns out that she's a reporter from the Cairo Sun and wants to get an exclusive on this chamber opening. She says Dr. Fieldman, Uncle Ben's research partner, that he really doesn't like, gave her permission. Uncle Ben doesn't buy this, but he's digmatized and decides to let her come too as long as she promises not to take any pictures or write anything until he gives the okay. On their way in, Nyla is suddenly like, oh my god, twinsies, and grabs Gabe's necklace. Turns out she has an amber pendant too, except hers is lacking a scarab beetle, so not exactly twinsies. After this thrilling exchange, we suddenly transition to, I'm not really sure how I got lost. I know how, Gabe, because you know how to keep this plot moving. He got lost at some point after commenting on one of the markings on the wall, it looked like Bart Simpson, because it's 1994 and then he knocked his headlamp out. They really need to attach a rope to this child. Now poor Gabe is lost for like the fourth time in his life, in the dark, in a pyramid. He does the smart thing to do when lost and decides to stay put until the others come back for him, except that he leans against a wall and falls right on through into darkness. He hits the ground and is quickly very, very itchy. His headlamp suddenly comes back to life and it reveals hundreds of tiny white spiders all over him. He tries to brush them off but there are too many. As he's looking around, he notices the walls are moving with them too. So this is just like when he landed in the scorpion pile in the last book. He looks up and sees a snake coming right for his face, but Gabe is just rattled because the snake is actually a rope and Uncle Ben is trying to pull him up to safety. Once Gabe is freed from the hole, Uncle Ben lets everybody know that there are hundreds of traps like this to keep people from finding the actual burial chamber. Gabe wants to make sure his mummified child's hand is still okay, and it's fine aside from still being cold. Nyla is immediately like, is that a summoner? Because this little hand is famous. While moving ahead, the summoner's fingers suddenly start moving and Gabe takes this as a possible warning. We jumped to two days later, and the chamber still hasn't been opened. Sari and Gabe have spent the last two days in the tent playing my favorite board game Scrabble, and Uncle Ben and Nyla have been flirting. Although, I guess today's the day they're actually going to open the chamber according to Uncle Ben. We spend quite a bit of time describing the door, which is now petrified wood with a gold seal. Nyla insists on photographing the moment, even though Uncle Ben had insisted earlier that no photos, but he's easily convinced. Uncle Ben goes to finally chisel open the door when a voice shouts, Please, let me rest in peace, causing everybody to simultaneously shit themselves. Uncle Ben turns around to see his Dr. Omar Fielding, his research partner mentioned earlier that he doesn't like. Dr. Fielding starts insisting that they should respect Prince Koru's wishes and leave the tomb undisturbed. Uncle Ben is like, that's cool and all, but I'm a scientist and I'm opening this shit up, which doesn't go over well. Dr. Fielding reminds them all that the seal above the tomb says, do not disturb the prince, and that if anybody does and then says the magic words five times, the prince will come after them in revenge. So it kind of sounds possible to go in there and just not say the magic words five times to me. Uncle Ben then tells everybody if they don't like it, they are free to leave, and none of the workers do, aside from Dr. Felding. It's dismissed as Dr. Felding just being jealous and wanting to take credit for the discovery. We get back to opening this door, which takes a while because we have to get through the golden seal, Uncle Ben stopping to make jokes every other paragraph, and then the door keeps getting jammed. Once the door is fully open, they all rush in, only to find that the chamber is completely bare. 
This is like when I was a kid and I watched a robot live on TV over the course of two hours go into a new pyramid tunnel, drill a hole through a door with a camera, only to reveal another door. Find out <clears throat> if and what is behind that stone door. Let's have a look at what's happening. Let's see. Okay, the lights are on. You can see the camera making its steady progress towards the hole there. Now, Zahi, talk us through what's happening. Just the camera is getting in the hole now, but I can't see anything. Okay. Now, oh my goodness, look at that. <gasps> what? We're this? hearing shrieks inside here. I've got to tell you, this team of archaeologists has been waiting for this moment for months and months. This is incredibly exciting. What are we seeing, Zahi? We, we can see another sealed door. Another sealed door? Yeah. Oh, what are these markings on the door? There seems it's to be just, some black marks. It's or is a that a cracks. Crack? It's a cracks. Wow. Gabe is disappointed, but Sari and Uncle Ben are still smiling because they expected this to happen, according to them, since ancient Egyptians did this often, making multiple fake chambers to get through before reaching the real one. So they scoot on over to the next door and begin working on it. This takes an entire chapter of basically what we just read in the previous chapter. Uncle Ben chilling at a door, making jokes, it getting stuck, breaking for lunch, chiseling some more, it getting stuck again, and then finally the door opens, only to have Uncle Ben say, we've made a huge mistake. Except he's just being tricky for the sake of a chapter ending, and it's actually the tomb is even, even better find than King Tut's, and it's full of treasure. They're clearly not into preserving things and carefully documenting, because within two minutes of being in that tomb, Uncle Ben has the workers opening Kit Prince Koru's mummy case. They all stare in amazement at the mummy, and Uncle Ben declares it the best preserved mummy ever found. For now, probably not after just flinging it open haphazardly. While they're all enjoying their victory, they're suddenly interrupted by four uniformed armed cops, all demanding they step away from the mummy. Dr. Fielding appears and is like, don't worry, I just brought them to protect the mummy. No biggie. Uncle Ben thinks this level of force is unnecessary, but Dr. Fielding is like, once word gets out that there's treasure just sitting here, people are going to try to come and take it, which is a valid point. Counterpoint, corrupt cops will probably just help themselves too. Once all the cop drama settles down, we cut to that night where everybody is celebrating with a barbecue. Nyla comments, Prince Koru was so short, he'd be a midget today, which is some choice language. Uncle Ben eventually reveals the magic words, Teki Karu, Teki Kara, Teki Kari. Gabe takes note because he plans on scaring Sari with this information. He just has to be sure to say it five times. I thought he meant later at the tomb, but that night in the tent, he's immediately like, dare me to say it five times, and Sari couldn't care less. Gabe does it anyways, and the entire time it's very clear that he's scaring himself more than anything. After completing the chant, the kids are startled by a rough voice outside the tent door, asking if anyone is in there. Gabe thinks the mummy somehow managed to crawl out of the pyramid into the tent in a matter of seconds, but ends up being Dr. Fielding looking for Uncle Ben. Gabe and Sari don't trust Dr. Fielding, so they decide to follow him. They watch him gather Uncle Ben from the communications tent and head towards the pyramid. The kids are uncertain if Uncle Ben is going willingly, because it looks like they're arguing. The kids decide to follow them, but once they reach the pyramid, they decide it's probably not the best idea to crawl in there without flashlights, without knowing where they're going, so they decide to stand guard outside and wait for them to come out. This takes a chapter, but eventually, of course, only Dr. Fielding comes out, ignores the kids, leaving the two kids to think something happened to Uncle Ben. Gabe races back to the tent to get some flashlights while Sari waits outside just in case Uncle Ben reappears. He doesn't, so the kids head on in. Once inside, they don't really know which way they're supposed to go, so we spend a chapter with them wandering aimlessly around until they reach the main chamber. None of this is very interesting so far. This is just like kind of a less version of the first mummy book, and really hasn't added anything new. I keep thinking, why did this need to be made? After reaching the burial chamber, they shockingly find Uncle Ben tied up and sealed in the mummy's case. Who saw that coming? Uncle Ben is out cold and would have suffocated if the kids hadn't found him. As they're sitting there feeling relieved, they suddenly realize if the mummy's not in its case, where is it? Right behind them, of course. The kids naturally freak out as the mummy looms towards them. It's somehow continuously blocking the entrance while also cornering them against a wall. It's also described as moving very slowly, so I'm not entirely sure why these kids can't just run around it. But anyways, the mummy is ready to murder them when Gabe has an idea. He goes to pull out his magic summoner, only to realize it's gone. They finally realize they're going to have to run past this mummy and come back for Uncle Ben. Gabe just barely gets by the mummy when they run to Nyla in the tunnel. They're like, thank god you're here. But surprise, Nyla was a succubus. She reveals she has Gabe's little mummy hand and shouts, come to me my brother. These children have incredibly bad luck with evil Egyptian adults. I guess Nyla is actually Princess Nyla, and she's been alive for centuries waiting for her brother's return. Or maybe she's possessed by the spirit or something. Regardless, she has the summoner and brought Prince Koru back to life. Nyla keeps saying how there has to be no witnesses, and orders her brother to kill the kids as she blocks the exit. But then we get an actual plot twist. The mummy moves past the kids and begins choking Nyla while saying, Let me rest in peace. She messed up by waking him up herself. She should have used a henchman like a good villain does when dealing with curses. For some reason, Gabe takes it upon himself to save Nyla by attacking the mummy. He's able to get his summoner back, but just sticks it in his pocket. Instead, he favors jumping on the mummy's back and trying to pry it off manually. 
In the process, he accidentally rips Nyla's amber pendant off and it shatters on the ground. She begins hollering about how her life was in that amber and that she used to crawl inside it at night to rest, like a pokeball. But now that it's broken, she's doomed. She begins shrinking thinner and thinner until all that's left is a pile of clothes, which a scarab beetle crawls out of and scurries off into the darkness. The kids acknowledge that Nyla is now the scarab, but neither of them move to stomp on it. They then just spend two pages explaining the Nyla situation to each other, in case the reader didn't catch it the first time I guess, which makes it even funnier when Gabe is suddenly grabbed from behind by the mummy. But no, it's actually just Uncle Ben, leaving me wondering, where in the hell is the mummy now? Oh, he's just standing there frozen. That's exciting. Uncle Ben reveals that he and Dr. Fielding were suspicious of Nyla for a while, especially after she asked what the six magic words were, because he said he never mentioned that there were six words, yet he still went on to tell her about the words anyways, so okay. Dr. Fielding spotted Nyla sneaking into the pyramid, which is why he went to get Uncle Ben so that he could go investigate, but they were too late. Nyla had already brought the mummy back to life and knocked Uncle Ben unconscious, so Dr. Fielding just ran off to get help. Right after all this is revealed, they are shuffling further down the tunnel, and Gabe thinks it must be more mummies, but is Dr. Fielding with the police? Dr. Fielding is like, oh sorry, I was in shock, that's why I didn't say anything to you two. We just then jump later to the tent, and sorry is telling Gabe to watch out, that Nyla might be waiting to bite him. They established earlier that if you get bitten by one of these beetles, it's instant death, so Gabe would like to avoid that. Unfortunately for him, while he's crawling into bed, he suddenly shouts, ouch, and that's how it ends. There's no mummy 3, so I'm choosing to believe that Gabe just died from a beetle bite. There is a direct episode pairing for Return of the Mummy, and it's pretty similar to the episode in most ways. We have two notable actors this week with Daniel DeSanto and Anik Obenson. Daniel has gone on to be involved in a ton of acting and voice work projects, but he gets the most points for me for voicing Carlos in the Magic School Bus. Anik has done even more voice work, but I was a PBS kid so the standout for me was that she is Inez from Cyber Chase, which is still making episodes 20 years later. Okay, let's get into the episode. Oh, so that's how you say her name, my bad. Also, all I can hear is Carlos from the Magic School Bus. I'm here in Egypt, visiting my Uncle Ben and Cousin Sari. My Uncle Ben's an archaeologist. This was a good 90s duh. There's a real mummy in here? Duh. That's why they built it, Gabe. That's all logic from Sari. Oh, it's warm. That's because it communicates with the dead. That's because you've been carrying it around in your pocket. Thing makes a guest appearance. That's weird. You can really see why this kid went on to do voice acting. He's kind of good at it. Uncle Ben! You guys! That's a convenient pile of sand. Uncle Ben? Ah! Oh. I don't think that's native. Ah! Uh, Uncle Ben! Oh, well that's cute. Jump scare. Ah! Ah, ah! Uh oh, he lost his little friend. This would probably be my reaction too if he handed this to me. There's a bug. That's right. Yeah, well, Sarah, you got shit taste. Four thousand years ago. Great present, Dad. A dead bug. Oh, it's totally cool. Yours is empty. I think it's prettier without the dead bug. I see we're handling these ancient artifacts with care. Well, Gabe's dead. Gabe? What's that? My summoner! Here! Hey! Hey, where I go? Ah! He just ran straight into that wall. Ah! Oh, oh, oh. Ah! Gabe is coming for the title of Goosebump Scream Queen. Good luck, Sari. That probably weighs three times as much as you do. Great. We'll be the world's richest skeleton. What are you doing? I'm gonna open it. I like this Power Rangers creature. Mm -hmm. 
This movie walks with style. Koru is like five more minutes. Let me rest in peace. Koro! It's Princess Nila, your sister. Struck by Goosebumps Lightning. It's a good thing they found the exit so quickly this time. Something this way. Maybe he just wanted to get out too. Overall, I thought Return of the Mummy was a pretty boring book. It hit a lot of the same beats as the original, and really didn't add much to the story. We had an evil Egyptian as the main villain all along, a brief mummy encounter, falling into a pit of bugs, wandering a pyramid in the dark, and all of our characters interacting the exact same way as the first. It's not actively bad, but this just didn't need to be made. I'm going to give this one 3 out of 5 Beatles. Are there any good Goosebump sequels? Okay, on to our totals. Return of the Mummy didn't have any vomit, asshole victims, it's only a dreams or shoulder scares, but it did bring us back to the 90s. In Getting Jiggy with the 90s, we had three 90s moments. These included a flashback to life without cell phones at the airport, denim cutoffs, and a reference to Bart Simpson in the pyramids. This brings our total to 88. We had just one It's a Prank Bro in Return of the Mummy. This was when a man was filming a band-aid commercial dressed as a mummy, and he scared Gabe at Uncle Ben's request. This brings our series total to 44 It's a Prank Bros. Return of the Mummy had a total of 11 chapter cliffhangers. They were nothing to write home about, and quite a few were weirdly obvious, like when the police arrived at the pyramid. This raises our Goosebumps total to 279. The clunky cliffhanger award for this book goes to chapters 9 to 10, where Gabe has fallen in a pit of spiders and is about to get bitten in the face by a snake. Except wait, it's just a rope, never mind. Shocker ending. Our big twist in this story was when Gabe was getting ready for bed. Sorry warns him that Nyla the Scarab is probably out there looking to sting him to death, only for him to immediately hop in bed and shout ouch, thus sealing his fate in my mind. This brings our Goosebumps series total to 18. Well that's it for Return of the Mummy, an entirely unnecessary entry into the Goosebumps series. If you read this one first for some reason you might have found it more enjoyable, but I just felt trapped with an annoying character, reliving the first book essentially. Its biggest saving grace is that mummies are cool and a pyramid is a fun setting. Let me know in the comments what you thought of Return of the Mummy. Do you like Frosted Flakes? How about Raisin Bran? And what did you think of my mummy clothes this week? Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching and make sure you subscribe for... The pride, the love.